Today we're going to be learning Yevamo Daf Mem Bet, Maladim Lusimcha. Um, we're going to start at the bottom of Mem Aleph Amud Bet. We're continuing along this issue about the three month waiting period that we've been discussing for a while. Tanu Rabbanan. So the Brighta says, bottom of Mem Aleph Amud Bet, two lines from the bottom. Yevama Shachatsula Achim Betoch Shlosha. We have a Yevama who they did chalitza within three months. Now, normally you're supposed to wait for three months. What if they did chalitza before? Now, it's really okay because chalitza is not any, you're separating from the husband, so it's from the brother, so it's fine. She still needs to wait for three months in order to get remarried. She wants to marry somebody else, so she has to wait for three months. But after three months, pass, if it if she does the chalitza after three months passes, she doesn't need to wait for three months. So Havi, they asked a question. First, they're going to infer, and they're going to question it. From when from when do we count the three months? Not from the time of the chalitza. We're talking about three months from the time. Right? It seems pretty clear here. We're talking about three months from the time of death. Get. Why is this any different, though, than a get issue? Now, why get and what about get? So we're going to see. When do we count the three months from get? So there's actually a machlok at Rav and Shmuel about it. Rav says it's from the moment you give the get. From the time you write the get. Why would you write the get? So there's an assumption. There's something called a get yeshan. We've actually discussed this before, which is a get that after you write the get, the couple is back together again, okay? They, they're back in the same room, and then we have to be concerned that they have relations. If so, then we're going to have an issue because that apostles disqualifies the get. So therefore, one can make an assumption that from the moment the get is written, before the husband gives it to the wife, before they're even divorced, the couple is not, <coughs> is not allowed to have relations together. So therefore, based on this, what do we say? If, according to Shmuel, we go by the time the get was written, but according to Rav, we go by the time it was given to her, then even though we know they're separated from the time it was written, we still, according to Rav, we don't allow it until actually the time he gave the get. How does that compare to us? So we're going to say that with us, with our situation, when he dies, we know they're already not having relations. He's dead. But... You might have to wait till the formal act of chalitza that does the separation between them, which is like, right, even though it's not the same thing, it's quite different, but right now they're suggesting maybe it would be the same. And therefore it's a formal act that does it rather than whether, you know, the moment we know they're no longer together. So that's the question. I'm a rabba kavachomer. No, it's an obvious kavachomer here, okay? It's not like I could have come up and I'm sure the Gemara could have come up with a number of other answers as to why these cases are not really the same, but Rava gives this answer. He saw kareti tarta, he saw love lo The the moment of death, like the moment of the the right, the moment of death in general, is a moment where let's say we want to permit her to do yibum. Right? When do we start counting? Right? We we basically say it's the moment of death that's the one that determines. Um, when we count, we say you can do yibum. This is a case where they did chalitza and she wants to marry someone else. What allows you to do yibum with the brother? Remember, the brother is forbidden by karet if you sleep with your husband's brother. But in yibum, we permit it. And for when do we count the three months? From the time of death. There is no chalitza or other formal act. It's the time of death. So if the time of death can be used to count those three months, then obviously the time of death could be used to count the three months to permit her to go marry somebody, which is only an Isra La. Remember, if she if she goes and marries someone else, and she's not right before she does Yibum or Chalitza, so that's an Isra La. So basically, we're going to say if the three months from death is enough to permit Isra Kare of her brothers, her husband's brother, of course it's going to be enough to permit her to marry somebody else. So therefore, it's clear that it's three months from the time of death and we don't make any sort of comparison to get because it's a different, because of this kavachon. This is a quote from the Mishnah. The Mishnah said, not only does the Yavama have to wait three months, but all women have to wait three months. 
So Bishlam Ayyivama Kedamaran. We understand why Yivama needs to work three months. Ella Sharkola and Ashima Mai, but why all the other women? Amarav Nachman Amashmo Mishunda Kamar Kda Amar Kali Olechala Luhimu Lizaracha Kharecha. Lavchim bin Zarosha Rishon Lizarosha Shini. There's a Pasuk in Sefer Brashi, chapter 17, which says, God is promising, I'm going to give my, my covenant to you, to me and your children after, in order to be your God and to, to your children after. Lizaracha Kharecha which means that the understand from here, God is basically saying, I'm going to be your God and my presence will be upon you. That's only though, if you are connected to your children, meaning we know who's who. If we don't know who's who, then there's no Shekhinah. So therefore we say, you want to know exactly who your father is so that you can have God's presence upon you. So it's a reason that it's a little bit harder for us to grasp what exactly the meaning of this is. But they seem to think that there's this importance of knowing who your father is, who your parents are, in order to be able to continue, right, to, for God to be, um, his presence to be upon you. So Mativ Rabbah, Rabbah says, I have a bit of a question with this. It says in a bright, So also a convert, okay, a male and a female convert need to wait three months as well. In other words, a Ger and Gioret that got married, the, I'm sorry, they were a Gernagi or at the converted before they get married again. After they convert, they have to wait three months. OK, we no longer do this. I had a wedding in my house last week between a woman who converted. Um, they were already married, but now she converted and and they needed another wedding. That's what you do. So because it had to be done the day of the conversion. So we put together a wedding in our house and uh, we married them. So now. We don't do this waiting period of three months anymore. But according to this bright, you have to wait three months. So why? What's this between your zarachacharecha to know whether it's from before or from after? It doesn't, right? Everyone who converts is, is like they're born anew. It doesn't really, right? No one knows there is even, and it's, what, what's the issue here? And what does this have to do with anything? So, right, Rashi says we're specifically talking about not the situation I just said, but a ger shenit gayer v'ishtoimo. We don't do this anymore, mainly because it would be right. It would be hard, hard to say, oh, you were married before, now we're converting you, and now you can't live together. It would be very difficult. So in general, we don't do this. But according to this bride, you do. So now. Um, so what, and, and also, by the way, we're talking, what they're, what they're really saying is there's no two husbands here. It's basically the husband before and the husband after. It's the same person. So it's not like we need to know which child was it connected to. That's really the issue here. So hachanami ikalavchim ben zera shenizra b'ktusha lezera shelo nizra b'ktusha. You want to be able to distinguish between a child that was conceived when they were Jewish and a child that was conceived before they were Jewish. Okay, what the ramifications of this are? Right, there's different possible ramifications. Um, we talked about how a, a woman who converts with the fetus inside the kind of the conversion is done because of the mother but the, the child is still considered a convert rather than a child that's conceived after, which then wouldn't be considered a convert. There's certain ramifications. For example, if it's a woman, she can't marry a Kohen, although many people are, are working to actually pass him based on a different psikat halacha, which is only from age three is she considered a convert that can't marry a Kohen, and therefore this wouldn't really make a difference. So anyway, there's different possibilities as to what the meaning of the, you know, what the importance of this is. Rava gives a different explanation, okay? As opposed to the first explanation about having the Shekhinah come upon you because your children go after you. So he gives a different. But this will pull up the presentation. He says, shema isat Okay, he's going to give a, four different possible things that we could be concerned about, okay? The first is, maybe you'll marry your sister for, through your father, okay? What does that mean? Well, it's very simple. If we're not sure who your father is, if you get married within three months. So we have our situation here. We have Shula who's married to, um, no, sorry. Let's start with you. Elle is married to Ruvain. And then they get divorced. Okay, she's our mother that we're concerned about. She's the one who's going to give birth to this kid named David. So Yael and Ruvain have a child named, uh, so Yael and Ruvain are married. They get divorced. Then within three months, she marries Moshe. And then she has a baby, David. We don't know, is David a nine-month baby to Ruvain or a seven-month baby to Moshe? Yeah. If Reuven has another wife, Shula, and has a child, Hana, so if David is Moshe and Yael's son, then he might likely, okay, all these scenarios, by the way, are going to assume that we're going to, most people are going to think that he belongs to 
the second husband, Moshe, because he's born while Yael is married to Moshe. So if that's the concern, we're worried that he might end up marrying his sister, who he shares a father with, which is Reuven, because maybe if he's Reuven's son, he'll end up marrying Reuven's daughter with, with Reuven and Shula, who have absolutely nothing to do with Yael and Moshe, who are, right, who he thinks his parents are, and he knows his mother's Yael, he just doesn't know if Moshe is the father. So he can end up basically marrying his sister, thinking he has no connection to her. Again, sister through the father. Obviously, he's not going to marry his sister through his mother, because he knows she's his sister. Second concern. If Moshe and Yael have another son named Yonatan, right now we still don't know is David Moshe's son or Reuven's son. So if we think he's Moshe's son, but really he's Reuven's son, he could end up marrying Yonatan, who is his brother through his mother, not his father, if he's Reuven's son, they share a mother, not a father, but people will think, or he'll think that they share a father because he'll think he's been born to Moshe. And then, He'll end up marrying, if Yonatan dies without children and Yonatan was married to Devorah and they don't have children, Devorah will do Yibam with David. Now, David is his mother, is his, he's, in other words, if he belongs to Reuven, then they don't share the same father, which means there is no Yibam, but they are brothers through their mother because they share the same mother. So basically, he's going to end up sleeping with his brother's wife, which is against the law because there is no obligation of Yibam. Or Yibam eshet achiv me'imo. He could end up, right? Oh, sorry, this is the case. So here I just went to the next page, which is Devorah goes and does Yibum with David, and that is a forbidden relationship. Okay, next, Yotzi at the Mola Shuk. Assuming Moshe has a brother named Aram. Okay, now if Moshe dies without children. Now he has David, so they'll think that David's his son, right? Remember, that's the one that was born to the Yael, this woman who married Moshe within three months. So she marries Moshe within three months. So they have this baby, we don't know whose it is. We think that it's Moshe's baby. So Moshe dies without any other children and they don't realize that Yael is supposed to do even with Aaron, Moshe's brother. So Yael goes and marries somebody else, which is forbidden for her to do. So basically if Yael goes and marries somebody else, that will be a problem thinking that she had David with Moshe, and, but really he belonged to Ruben. So she'll end up having married someone without, right? That's an Isor love. It's not correct, but it's pretty serious. The final concern is that if, again, we're not sure if David is Ruben or Moshe's son, and Ruben has another son named Shlomo, and Shlomo dies without children, and Chana is his wife. She theoretically is supposed to do Yibum with, David, if he's really Reuven's son, because they're brothers through the father. But since we don't know, and we think he belongs to Moshe, she's going to go get married. And, you know, so he's going to mess up his mother, potentially not doing evil, and he's going to mess up his brother's wife, potentially not doing evil. Okay, now, because really he was supposed to do evil with her, but he didn't realize that they were brothers through the father. So those are all our concerns that Rav suggests. Mati Rav Hananya. Rav Hananya now brings a, a problem with this approach, Rav's approach. It says in a bright, all these forbidden relationships that the rabbis instituted, all these things, are all because of Erev problems. Vikan, but this institution, the rabbis instituted who can't marry or when they can't, the three-month issue, is Mishum Takanat Lad. It's because of the offspring that we're worried about. Din Itan, if it was really all the concerns Rabbi said, it really is Erva concerns because it could be Isra Kari, could be she married someone she wasn't supposed to marry, you know, she didn't do Yibum, and that's an Isra Lav, but that's all Erva. So, in Ita, Kulam Shum Takanat Erva, should have said all of these are Takanat Erva, including this list. So, what do they explain? It's really the Vlad, it's just the Vlad, the offspring, is the one who's causing Erva issues. So you could still call it Takana Erva, a Takana Vlad, but it really means Erva. So that's not really such a problem. Now we're going to get into a slew of questions that I already, I'm going to tell you from the start. The Gemara had possible answers, easy answers they could have answered for this. I'm not sure why they didn't, or at least, or maybe I'm misunderstanding it. Possible. But it seems to me like there's pretty basic, easy answers to why this is not the case. But they're going to raise some questions, give their own answers. I think it's possible they could have given other answers as well. What they want to focus now is on why three months. So Bishlama Tamtin Shnechodashi, Vitina Selo. We understand why she can't wait two months and get married, because she waits two months, it's married after two months, has a baby after seven months. It's exactly our concern, right? E Bartisha Lakama, 
Ibar Shiva Lebatra, right? That, sorry, I skipped two words, Tahainu Sveka. That's exactly our debate. We're, we're assuming in all these cases, and this is why it's a little problematic, that she gets pregnant, that she gives birth within seven months. And then we're going to worry it's seven months to this one, nine months to that one. So in the case of two months, we understand it's a total issue. It's exactly it. Seven months to that, nine months from the death of the husband, it would be a, with the first husband, it would be a big spake. But you could say, she could wait one month and then get married. If she gives birth seven months later, if she gives birth exactly seven months later, it must be seven months from the other, from the new husband. Because, now here's the tricky part, because we're assuming when did the husband die? Eight months ago. So eight months is never going to be a Vlad Shalkayama. Remember, an eight month baby never makes it. Why they don't say, it could have been she got pregnant a month before. We don't really know why they don't suggest that. Maybe I'm missing something, but for some reason, they don't think that's a possibility. It doesn't concern me so much because in the end, they're going to reject it for some other reason. So they could have rejected it for that reason as well. The Elitim Naya Yalda, let's say she gives birth eight months later. So hi, Bartisha Adakamahu. Then it's obvious it's nine months from the first husband because then, okay, so here they say they're jumping a month back, right? It was basically a nine-month baby. Theoretically, you could say maybe it's a nine-month baby that was born early, okay? But it's a little, again, it all really depends on how you understand this eighth-month baby, or maybe she got pregnant a month before he died. But they say, all right, so here they're going to say, so now they say no, because it's not clear it's going to be the nine-month from the other one, because it could be just because you give birth eight months after having um, gotten married, maybe it's from the second guy. Maybe she waited a month before getting pregnant. It could be seven from the new ones. But again, their rejection shows that their question is a little bit off because obviously, right, we would have said that. You know, it's just because it's eight months from the moment she got married doesn't mean it's a nine-month baby to the other one. It could really be a seven-month baby and they just waited a month before she got pregnant. Why doesn't she wait two and a half months? That should work. Why? If she gives birth exactly seven months later, it's clearly seven to the new one. Because they're, again, they're just assuming if it's exactly seven months, it'll be seven to the new one, even though not necessarily. If it's six and a bit, then then seven months haven't passed. It must clearly be a nine-month baby. So then they say... But, right, to Ibar Batrahu, Barshitu Palgalochai, right? Because we're assuming if it was from the first guy, but the second husband, a baby's not going to be able to be born in six and a half months and survive. So then they say, Inami, ah, but you could say, Lashitu Palgayalda. No, you could say, really, she could give birth six and a half months later for a seven month baby. It really could be. How do we know this? Now, before we continue, I want to just point out what's medically accurate and what the rabbis, right? Nowadays, people assume the later the baby's born, the more likely the baby's going to survive. In those days, they believed that this, there was something about an eight-month baby, and that was not going to be a viable baby. So it's either seven or it's nine, but it's not that eight, okay? How far we go with that, we're going to see in a minute, depending on the different opinions. So now, you would assume that Right nowadays, if it's eighth month, it has more of a chance of survival than seven months, right? Even though, thank God, nowadays, modern medicine, many seven month babies do survive, but the more, the more, the longer, obviously, we know it's been. They didn't really understand things that way. So now they say, even if you believe that a nine month baby doesn't, isn't born like in the beginning of the ninth month, that's more like an eight month baby, but it needs to like, it needs to basically have the full nine months. Okay, again, there were these different opinions about this. So even if you say that, everyone agrees, and even though this is counterintuitive, specifically seven-month babies could be born into the seventh month. Okay, beginning of the seventh month, which is really like six and a bit months pregnant, pregnant could. And that proves six and a half is going to be a problem because you still then could say it's maybe the seven-month baby. How do we know this? Interestingly, they're going to prove it from the Nevi'im, from Sefer Shmuel, with Chana. So by Chana, when she finally has Shmuel, she gives birth, it says, 
Tkufot means seasons, and yamim means days. So they say tkufot is plural, that means two, right? Mi'ut tkufot, the minimum is shnaim, right? When you put anything in plural, minimally it means two. It means there were two seasons that passed, that's 62 months, and I'm um, sorry, six months. And then mi'ut yamim is shnaim, minimum days, l'tkufot hayamim, so that's two seasons and two days. So that adds up to six months and two days. So they explain from here, Hana must have given birth after six months and two days. And from here you see that it works. So now that you could give birth, in which case that's why it can't be two and a half months. So now they give one last suggestion. Why doesn't she wait like a week or so and then get married? Then we'll check exactly three months later and see if she's pregnant. If she's pregnant, it's clear it's from the first husband, the first pregnancy, the first husband. If not, We'll assume it's the next, right? It's from the next. That's when she eventually gets pregnant. It must be she wasn't pregnant at the three month point. So, you know, if she's pregnant a week later, we can assume it comes from the second husband. So now they say, how are they going to check her? So the assumption is that they check her breasts because her breasts change while she's pregnant. So now, Amarav Safra, it's not exactly appropriate for their husbands, the people who are checking women like that. They didn't like that. Of course, not so appropriate for the women either. I'm not really sure why they don't say that. But in any case, they seem, right, this is classic that the Gemara is focused mainly, right, unless it's a particularly women issue, which again, could say this is a women issue, but they're looking from their vantage point, right? You can't blame them really because that was their vantage point. So obviously in a case where it wouldn't be an issue for him, but would be an issue for her, maybe they would bring up her issue. In this case, it's already an issue for the men. Not so, you know, they're not so happy that people are checking out um, they're women and whether they're pregnant or not in this way, it's not so appropriate. So why don't we pick a more appropriate way? Here's an interesting assumption. The assumption is that women are heavier when they're right, not just in weight, but in the way they walk when they're pregnant. So therefore their steps are, are deeper. So their footprints are deeper. So that means that we could check their footprints and check by that, whether they're pregnant. Interesting method. So Amarami Barhama, Isha Mechapa Atzma Kadesh Yirash Ben Abba Nechsei Bala. This is a fascinating line. All sorts of things you learn about their society in today's life, especially. So women would try to tiptoe around or not press heavily on the floor so that no one would suspect them of being pregnant because they didn't want people to think that they were pregnant with the first husband's baby because they wanted to ensure that their next son would get a proper inheritance from his father who's still alive. And therefore she wanted the son who was better financially for the son to be considered of the next husband's child. So therefore, right, obviously, unless the father had a huge inheritance, but I guess the assumption is he died. And now we have someone who's alive, who's still making money, can therefore pass on inheritance to his son. So therefore she'd rather that. So therefore we can't check her footprints because she might fake them out a little bit so that we won't catch on to her. Very interesting uh, theory here. Again, whether this is true or not almost doesn't matter to the Gemara. What they're trying to say is there's no foolproof way to check and that's why we have to wait the three months. And that's really all these seemingly strange suggestions were really just suggestions to try to say maybe there's some other way to do it. And in the end, they basically say no. It sounds like what they're saying from all this though, if we know her to be pregnant, for sure, then it sounds like she'd get married because there's no concern over who the child is. We already know she's pregnant with the first one, so it'll be clear. Well, if that's the case, Salam Atanya, and then since it seems like that's implied from all these sources, why does it say in a bright time? This would go back to this interesting halacha we saw earlier. You can't marry a woman who's pregnant or nursing someone else's child. And now we're going to finally understand this case a little bit better, although it's going to be quite strange, the suggestions they're going to suggest. Again, based on perceptions they had of how they understood without having modern science. So if he did marry her, he has to divorce her. So it can't be that once he knows she's pregnant, he can marry her. Because then you have a separate problem. He can't marry her when she's pregnant. Why is this? We're worried that you're going to turn the... the fetus that's inside into a sandal, which basically means you're going to crush it because you're going to get her pregnant. And that one fetus is going to basically crush the other. So then the Gemara says, wait a minute, if you're worried about that, then you have to worry even when the couple's married, 
when she gets pregnant, then they can't have relations. And it never says you can't do that. His own child, he can't then have relations with his wife when she's, when she's pregnant. So, there's two answers given as to why you can do that. One is either you use birth control, which is very interesting to think about because it's specifically the time when people don't use birth control. Or, right nowadays, or we say, let God help. Okay, we, we hope that God protects the, the fetus inside and we do what we do. So if you say that, hafanami, you can say the exact same thing here. Husband B can come and marry her and no problem. Either they can have relations using a ball, right, birth control, or, right, it means putting something inside to block the semen from going in, or we'll hope God helps. So we're concerned that he's going to crush her while they're having relations and, and endanger the fetus. So of course they say, well, then we're worried about a regular husband that will do that. And this doesn't have to be only in this unique situation. And again, nobody ever says that you can't do that. So if it's your own child, you're going to be more gentle about it and you won't crush her, which will crush the fetus, which might cause the child to be in danger, the fetus to be in danger. So, right, again, there's this weird concern, which in the end is going to, right, we're going to reject all this, by the way. But in the end, we are going to see that there's this concern. The new husband is not going to really care too much about this fetus. So Ella, well, then I'm going to say the whole pregnancy thing has nothing to do with her being pregnant specifically because there's danger to the fetus now. It's because, moving to Amubet now, we're going to assume anyone who's pregnant, the assumption is she'll have a child and then she'll become nursing. So the whole issue is the nursing issue. And therefore, when she's pregnant, the concern is she'll be nursing soon, and then we don't want them to be married. So that's why we don't let them marry now, because she has to go through nursing still. In other words, again, what's the concern? Maybe she'll get pregnant while she's nursing, and then it will dry up the milk supply, and then it'll kill the baby, and that we don't want. So So then again, we have this problem. How can the husband right? Her regular husband, if it wasn't this kind of situation, her husband was still alive. He can't have relations with her when she's nursing because maybe she'll get pregnant. So ah, he can supplement with, right? He can buy eggs and milk for the child and the child won't starve. So then they say again, ping pong back to this case then with the extra husband, right? The new husband who comes in, who marries her when she's married, when she's pregnant or nursing. So he'll get some extra eggs and milk for the kid and, you know, kid will survive. So lo yav la ba. By the way, it's interesting to see what the kid, little kid, little babies ate. They ate eggs and, and milk, right? It's funny. Nowadays, my memory is right. We don't give kids eggs right away unless it's changed since my kids were little, but right, we don't give them eggs right away. It's actually something people could be allergic to, but they have eggs and milk, right? Milk is also something you don't give them right away. You give them formula, but not actually milk. Anyway, um, so what do they say? Lo yav labam. The husband won't give her the money for it. That costs money. He'll say, that's not my kid. I don't need to give you money for that. To which the final question, and it again gets to some interesting assumptions about, right? First of all, it's just interesting to think about a husband. He'll starve his wife's first children. You know, he won't care about them. But she could go to the heirs of the, right? Whoever else inherited the possessions of the, her husband and say, I need money for my, for my baby. That's very strong. The woman is embarrassed to go to the court and on account of that, she might end up killing her son because, again, if she marries this other guy, she'll get pregnant, her mouth will dry up, and she'll be embarrassed to go to the court and ask, demand money from the heirs of the, her first husband's estate. Why is she embarrassed? It's a good question. Um, I was thinking about the fact that um, she might, right, they might claim, um, why did you go get married to somebody else? You know, why doesn't he pay for it? Right? You, you, Imagine that situation will come up. They'd say, oh, you now have a new husband. Because right? once she gets remarried, she kind of disconnects from the old family. And if she goes and says, listen, I need money for, for this guy's son, they'll say, you know, well, you got a new husband. Let him take care of it. Or maybe she'll be embarrassed that she married someone else, right? It'll cause her, like she doesn't, like they'll say, oh, we told you so, you know, and now look, you got pregnant and now you can't support the child on your own, which you could have with your nursing milk and you dried up. So she doesn't want to start an issue. You could kind of see that. 
So anyway, that's an interesting, uh, very interesting sugya, hard to, you know, it's very different from our reality nowadays and what we know about modern science. It's interesting to see how they uh, approach these things and what kind of answers they gave. And, you know, again, you have to remember, they're pushed into a corner to say things here. So it could be that everything they're saying is not exactly true. It's just trying to get you an answer to answer the questions that they had. Okay, back to the Mishnah. The Mishnah had said, everybody needs to wait three months. And then it ta- we had a three-way machlok. Tanakama said, I'll read you the whole Mishnah now. I'm going to go part by part. Echab etulo, echab ulo, right? Whether they're virgins or non-virgins, whether they're grushot or almanot, divorcees or widows, whether they're married, nisuot, they were married before, or arusot, or just engaged. So then, that was the first thing. Rabbi Yehuda says, hanisuot yitar suva, arusot yinasu, the ones who are married can get engaged. And because engagement doesn't mean you're, you're having relations. So there's no concern of the confusion about the children. And the ones who are only engaged before their husband died can get married because, there's, again, there's no concern of two husbands. Chutzman, I was be you only the ones in Judea. Shemi Pleshli go basbehem. They often had relations before the actual marriage took place. Rabbi Yossi, Omeo, Kola Nashimit, or Su, Chutzman, Almana. All women can get engaged. You don't have to worry about it other than a widow because she has to have some mourning time. Okay, that's a different issue. So the first line we're dealing with is this. So there's six things listed there. Virgins, women who've already had relations, women who are divorced, women who are widowed, women who are married, and women who are engaged. So now the Gemara says, so. Virgins basically means they were engaged because we're not talking about virgins who weren't even engaged because they obviously wouldn't need to wait three months. Ones who have relations is the same as married women. So you're saying the same thing. So they say, this This is how it should be. It's not one, two, three, four, five, six. It's one or two. Or this or beulot, which became either widowed or divorced, and whether it was from marriage or divorce. Okay, I'm sorry, marriage or engagement. Okay, so it's basically one line that talks about all this, right? About two basic cases, or two cases that kind of split into were they widowed or were they divorced, and then was it from erusin or was it from gerushin? But it's not six cases that are parallel to each other. Amar Rabbi Elazar lo ala beit midrash. We now get a story. Rabbi Elazar didn't go to beit midrash one day. Eshkachel Rabbi Asi finds Rabbi Asi amarly might amor rabbana be beit midrash. What are the rabbis saying in the beit midrash today? What did they say? Amarle hachi amar Rabbi Yochanan halachat ke Rabbi Yosi. So what I learned today was that the Rabbi Yochanan holds like Rabbi Yosi that again anyone can get engaged because you're not worried about marriage. So now they say wait. If it was Tanakama versus Rabbi Yehuda versus Rabbi Yossi, usually Tanakama represents the rabbi's opinion, which is the majority. So why are you holding like Rabbi Yossi? Or why was Rabbi Yochanan holding? So Michlal di Yechida'a Paligale, he questions him and he says, right, um, Rabbi, who was it? Sorry, Rabbi Elazar asked Rabbi Asi, is it because he didn't think it was in uh, uh, the Rabim? He didn't think Tanakama was the majority, it was an individual's opinion? To which Rabbi Asi answers, in yes. It's actually just one individual's opinion. It's not the rabbi's opinion. How do I know this? Because there's a bright that says, We're now going to have all sorts of situations where it's clear that the woman was not living with her husband. And therefore, it's clear she's not pregnant with him. So with his child. So if she was always going to her parents' house and never really sleeping in her husband's house. There was a big fight between them. Right? And they were separated. He was in jail. Or he was old or sick. Couldn't have children. She was sick. Or she had a miscarriage after he already died. Clear, she's not carrying his child. Or she was barren. Or old. Or ktana. Or ailonit, right? That woman who never reached maturity. Or for some other reason, she can't have children. Mayor says, no matter what, you have to wait three months. That matches Tanakam and our Mishnah, which shows that Tanakam is actually Rabbi Mayor's opinion. And that's why he has a let. Rabbi Yochanan can pass like Rabbi Yossi over Rabbi Meir because individual versus individual. And that same Braita brings a different opinion. Rabbi Yehuda matir le'aresu le'nasemiyad. He says you can get engaged or married immediately if you're a woman in one of these situations where it's clear you're not pregnant from your first husband. Amar Rabbi Chia, or you're not pregnant at all, but clearly not from your first husband. Amar Rabbi Chia Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Chia comes and says Rabbi Yochanan changed his mind. 
Originally, he held like Rabbi Yossi. After that, he changed his mind and held like the like Tanakama, like Rabbi Meir. How do we? So now, Amar Rav Yosef, if he had a baby, Manita de Karma had a If he really changed his mind, it must be because he heard the Brita from, it was taught in Karen Yavna. Remember, that's the term for Yavna when the, the Sanhedrin was there. And we're going to see the Brita right now. Titania, it says in a Brita, Amar Rabbi Ishmael, Benosh Rabbi Yochanan, Ben Broka. Shamati me Picha Hamim, Be Karen Yavna. I heard from the rabbis in Karen Yavna, Kulan, Srichalan, Tin, Shloshafagashim. So when Rabbi Yishmael said this, that all women need to wait, that was a decision they made in Karen B'yavne. It must be when Rabbi, Yehuda heard, Rabbi Yochana heard that bright day, he changed his mind. That's what Rabbi Yosef assumes. I'm only Rabbi Yirmiel, the Rabbi Zerika. Ki ailet kamei to Rabbi Yavau. So Rabbi Yirmiel says to Rabbi Zerika, when you get to Rabbi Yavau, uh, sorry, when I was in front of Rabbi Yavau, Rabbi Yirmiel says, Rame, like someone asked the following question. Mi amar Rabbi Yochana alacha ke Rabbi Yossi? How could Rabbi Yochana hold like Rabbi Yossi? Vahama Rabbi Yochana alacha ke stam mishnah. Does Rabbi Yochanan always hold by the Stam opinion in the Mishnah, the one that comes without a name? Utnan, and what does it say in our Mishnah? Right, they can't get married or engage. They need to wait three months, etc. Right, and that seems clear that's the Stam. And Rabbi Yochanan is known to always hold like the Stam. So Amr Leh, when Rabbi, when Rabbi Yavau heard this, Rabbi Yirma was telling Rabbi Zreka, he said, Whoever suggested, oh, sorry, I think Amarle is, must be um, Rabbi Yirmiya says to Rabbi Zreka says to Rabbi Yirmiya, whoever asked this question, doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm just going to check exactly who's talking to who. But anyway, means he wasn't concerned about his flower. You know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay, there's different ways to understand that term. does not not so important for our purposes. Uh, okay, so sorry. Rabbi Yavau says it to Rabbi Zreka. Rabbi Zreka, when they got to the Beit Midrash, okay, sorry, let me explain it better if the exactly, a little details aren't so important, but Rabbi Yirmiya said to Rabbi Zreka that when you go to Rabbi Yavau, ask him this question. Sorry, Rabbi Yirmiya tells Rabbi Zreka to ask that question to Rabbi Yavau. And then when Rabbi, when Rabbi um, Zreka asked the question to Rabbi Yavau, which was Rabbi Yirmiya's question, he says, Rabbi Yirmiya doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay, so what? Because stam v'acharkach, um, stam v'acharkach machloket he. This case in our mission is not a regular case where Rabbi Yochanan Paskin's like the stam. It's a stam and then a machloket. It's Tanakama, then Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Yos. So basically the stam appears and then a machloket. So when you have a stam v'acharkach machloket, uh, machloket ain't alachak is stam. In that case, you don't hold like the stam. In other words, this isn't a classic case of stam. How do I know this? Tam Rapapa, the Tam Rabbi Yochanan, and that's either Rapapa said or Rabbi Yochanan. Machloket, the Harkah, Stam of the Hakistan. First, you have a Machloket, then you get the Stam opinion, then we hold like the Stam. But Stam, the Harkah Machloket, if first you have an opinion, again, Stam means unattributed, no name, which is what we had in our Mishnah. If first you have a Stam, and then you have a Machloket, which is our Mishnah, and al Hakistan. Okay, so that just proved what he said. Okay, Rabbi Yavau was leaning on the shoulders of Rabbi Nachum Hushamash. And what happened? So while they were walking, he started asking him halachic questions. Okay, so now, here goes his question. And this continues with the discussion that we were just talking about. Um, just one second. Right. So basically what they explain is that what Rabbi Nachum was doing was he was collecting halachot, like what we hold like in certain situations. So then he asked him, Bamine, Machloket, Vacharkastam. So now he asked Rabbi Yavau the following question, exactly our issue. If you have a Machloket and then there's a Stam, then my, what's the situation, right? That's the reverse of our mission. Amalei, Halachakistam. So then he says, Stam, Vacharkach, Machloket, my, Amalei, and Halachakistam. This basically matches exactly what we saw just before. Stam, Adibanitib, but then he asked a whole bunch of other things. If in the Mishnah, it's just one opinion, no Machloket. But then there's some other source which has a machloket. Then what do we say? My amalei halachak is stam. We pass him like the stam there. So then he says, ha machloket b'manitim the stam of the My what do we do if it's a machloket in a in a bright if it's a stam in a bright in a bright but a machloket in the Mishnah? What do we do? So he answers say amarle the chi rebi lo shnaa rebi chi amenayim. If Rebbe didn't teach it, then where did Rabbi Chia get it from? Okay, Rabbi Chia was known to, the Tosefta was attributed to him, and Rabbi, uh, Rebbe, the Mishnah was attributed to him. So we're basically saying, if in the Mishnah it didn't appear, and Rabbi Chia, who basically we're assuming he was not just the Tosefta, but maybe he was in charge of all the other bright, 
if he, right, if Rabbi, if Rebbe didn't know what the halacha was, then who's Rabbi Chile to say he knows? So basically, don't trust the brighter over the Mishnayot. The Mishnayot would have superiority over the bright over the Mishnayot. So what would you do in this case? Machloket and Brighta, Stam, uh, Machloket and Mishnah, Stam and Brighta. You wouldn't go by the Stam for no reason. You would basically have to look into it and decide on based on some other reason how you would pass it in that case. Okay, but not by these rules, basically. With that, we'll finish for today and we'll continue with this topic in tomorrow's class. Well, Adim, listen, class.